Hello, welcome to the Introduction to Proofs video for Cardinality, Definitions. My name is Professor Michael Polyuk. The learning objectives for this video are, by the end of this video, you should be able to define relative cardinality and state and prove basic abstract results about cardinality. Let's start with some motivation about cardinality. Do you have more fingers on your left hand or your right hand? Take a moment right now to check. Now, I'm asking this question mostly because I want to see the technique by which you answer this question. Did you count one, two, three, four, five, uh, and then check that both have five, and then said, well, since they both have five, they have to have the same amount? Or can you do it without counting? So one way to do it without counting is to match your fingers from your left hand to your right hand. And you match them uh, in such a way that pinkies go to pinkies, ring fingers to ring fingers, etc so that you've paired them off. And now you can tell that they have the same number, they're the same amount, without uh, knowing exactly what exact number it is. So that's part of what we're gonna do today, is figure out how can we compare quantities without counting them. Let's look at a simple, second example. Are there more people or more chairs in this picture? Now, the argument that you might want to use is, well, there are more people because we can pair, everyone has a chair that they're sitting in. And that's mostly true, except for this guy right here. So let's give that guy a chair and then the argument will be much clearer. So there we go. We moved that guy over from the middle onto this chair. He's now standing on this chair. And now in this one, we can see that every person has a chair associated with them. And this person is maybe standing next to their chair, but that's their chair. And what we see is that there are some chairs that are left over. This tells us that there are more chairs than people. Now, notably, we didn't have to count how many people there were and how many chairs and compare those numbers. So we're gonna be able to do this without uh, using numbers. So we don't need to use numbers. And we can use uh, the language of functions, like injections, surjections, and bijections, to measure relative quantities. And that's going to be the goal of the cardinality section. So let's take a moment to think about what type of function is the assignment of people to chairs. So what's its domain, codomain? Is it injective, surjective, or bijective? Take a moment to think about that right now. In this case, it's a function from the set of people in the picture to the set of chairs in the picture. And it's an injection, but not a surjection. We can tell that it's an injection because there's no uh, two people in the same chair. And what would it mean if this was not a function? Well, that would look like one person split across two chairs. So using arguments like this can help us really understand what uh, non-injections and non-bijections look like, and non-surjections and non-functions. By the way, why is this not a surjection? Well, there's a chair that's empty, for example, this one. Now let's go to some definitions. Let A and B be two sets. We define the cardinality of A is less than or equal to the cardinality of B if, well, what? And when do we say that their cardinalities are equal? Well, think about the hand example and think about the chair example. So the first one is like the chair example. So we say that the cardinality of A is less than the cardinality of B, if and only if there is an injection where the domain is A and the codomain is B. Now, when are they equal? Well, they're equal if there's a bijection. Now, these are the definitions that we're going to use, but it can sometimes be a little bit confusing to think about. So let's take a moment to think about what this means informally. Informally, the cardinality of A is going to be the number of elements in A. And be warned that it has nothing to do with absolute values. This is uh, sometimes a common misunderstanding, is that people think that this has to do with the absolute value. So we're gonna, you can think of it informally as the number of elements in A, but we're not going to use that as our definition. We're going to use these two things. So note that these two, def these two definitions say how to compare two cardinalities 
it doesn't tell you how to compute a given cardinality. And that's something for a, a later course. Now let's look at some simple properties and some simple examples of theorems. Let A, B, and C be sets. Assume that the cardinality of A is less than or equal to the cardinality of B, and the cardinality of B is less than or equal to the cardinality of C. What do you think the conclusion should be? Well, the conclusion is going to be that the cardinality of A is less than or equal to the cardinality of C. That's how less than or equal to works, so you expect it to work like this. So let's prove this. Let's assume the if part. So assume that the cardinality of A is less than or equal to the cardinality of B, and the same with B and C. Now, what do these things mean? What's the definition of these two things? The definition is there are injections from A to B and, injection, and, an, and an injection from B to C. That's the definition. And now our goal is to create an injection from A to C. So how do we get an injection from A to C built out of these two things? Well, first apply F, then apply G. So we'll use a composition. Now this, will, this composition will be an injection from A to C because it's composed of other injections. And that's a lemma from a previous section. So by definition, the cardinality of A is less than or equal to the cardinality of C. So a couple things to point out. This is a proof by definition unwinding, and we need to use the definitions of these things. And the, there was one part where we actually had to think about what we wanted to do, but there was really only one move that we could make. Another thing you might notice is that this property feels a lot like transitivity for relative cardinalities. What other sort of basic lemmas and basic properties of cardinalities can you think of? Take a moment right now to write down as many as you can. Here are some that I came up with. These are all basic properties of cardinalities, and you should be able to prove all of these things using the definitions of cardinality. So I'll leave that as an exercise for you. Now we move on to the cantor schroeder bernstein theorem. So let A and B be sets. If the cardinality of A is less than or equal to the cardinality of B, and the cardinality of B is less than or equal to the cardinality of A, then what do you expect to be true? Well, in this case, you expect the cardinality of A to be equal to the cardinality of B. Now, a couple bits of warning here. This theorem is not a trivial fact. It actually requires a lot of work to show it, and it doesn't just use the basic definitions. So there's a couple reasons you can tell that. One of them is that uh, it has a, a named theorem, and it's named after three people. Uh, pay attention, we'll see Cantor a couple times in these notes. Another thing that's maybe more mathematical is that these two definitions require injections, but this one requires a bijection. So what you're asked to do is, from two injections, create a bijection. That doesn't sound too easy. Let's take a moment to think about this and how, why this is not an obvious fact. So as an exercise, construct an injection from the open interval to this closed interval, and construct an injection from the closed interval to the open interval. Take a moment to do that right now. So hopefully you've had a chance to work on that. This first one can be answered by using f of x equals x. You can check that that's an injection. This function won't work for the second one because the endpoints won't go anywhere. But instead, we can shrink everything by one half. Now, both of these are clearly injections, and if you try working on the third one, you're going to have a hard time coming up with a uh, bijection. I don't even know one off the top of my head uh, that's easy to write down. So even though coming up with injections both ways is relatively straightforward, actually constructing the bijection is not obvious. So this theorem is doing something really deep and really interesting. One useful lemma that we can extract from the first part is that if A is a subset of B, then the cardinality of A is less than the cardinality of B. And the proof of this is very straightforward. The injection you want is the identity injection. 
just f of x equals x. And this will always be well defined because when you plug in an a here, it'll output something in b, and we know that uh, a is a subset of b, so it'll be actually in the codomain. What about the converse of this? If you know that the cardinal, if the cardinality of a is less than or equal to the cardinality of b, do you know that a is a subset of b? Take a moment to think about this. The answer is no. So for example, the set 1, 2 has cardinality less than or equal to the set 4, 5, 6, but 1, 2 is obviously not a subset of 4, 5, 6. So be aware that it's very common for people to think that the converse is true without thinking about what it means. One last exercise for you. This is the finite Cantor Schroeder Bernstein. So let A and B be finite sets. Then the following two things are equivalent. So you can prove this on your own, and this proof with finite sets is much easier than the general Cantor Schroeder Bernstein. So prove this on your own and think about where did you use the fact that A and B were finite. Let's end off with some reflections. What is the definition of the cardinality of A is less than or equal to the cardinality of B? What are the sets A where the cardinality of A is equal to the cardinality of the empty set? What is the role of surjections in determining relative cardinality? Thank you very much and have a great day.